Right. Hello, we're live, I think. Um, so welcome, everyone. It's um, early on a Wednesday morning for those of you in the UK watching. And um, yeah, this is a sort of, I think the second in a series of interviews we're doing with inspirational founders and thought leaders. And this morning, I'd like to introduce you to Michael Townsend Williams, who's a friend of the Happy Startup School and someone who's worked with uh, admired from afar until recently when we've got to know each other. So welcome, Michael. Welcome, Lawrence. Good morning to you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, um, obviously your background's in um, in advertising many years ago. We watched your Do Lecture and got to know you through the Do Lectures, um, which is an event that, for those of you who don't know, um, happens in Wales. I believe you're an old friend of David Hyatt from, from what I remember. Yeah, yeah. David and I go back to the, 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 the mid-80s at Saatchi's um, and then we worked together again towards the end of the end of last century and then and then we bumped into each other again through the do lectures which is which is a great thing that he's done yeah exactly so the do lectures is a, uh, essentially it's a, a weekend which is started in wales many years ago but now i think they have them overseas in australia and the us from, from what i remember yeah and it's just a wonderful community a bit like what we're building with happy startup school of people who are trying to do positive things and from the people that we've met at Do Lectures, we're still in touch with today, you know, just inspired each other really to go off and do great things in the world. Um, and I seem to remember you said you've had a lot of people help you out with your business over the years who, who you've met in that community. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, I mean, um, everyone talks about finding your tribe, um, but, but, but you don't really know you found your tribe until you're actually in it. <laughs> yeah. And I think that that's what, you know, what you, know, you do with the Happy Startup School and, and also the Do Lectures do is actually, being around so many people that, 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 that share the same sort of values and um, ambitions as you do um, is, is a great thing to do, yeah. Brilliant. Um, so yeah, I just want to go back a little bit really just to hear a bit more about your story for those that don't know. So like you alluded to there, you worked in the advertising world in the 80s, which you can imagine was quite an interesting time. Yeah, it was, it, it, it was a fun time. It was a fun time. Uh, um, uh, Taking on David Hyatt's little phrase he uses for Hyatt Den Denham, which is do one thing well. I did do one thing well, and that was to drink a lot. <laughs> um, and um, in fact, uh, uh, on Friday afternoons at Saatchi's, we used to have the tea trolley. Um, tea lady would come around with a tea trolley, but instead of tea on the trolley, she'd have bottles of L'Anson champagne. And um, it was extravagant. It was fun. Um, a lot of the people I met there are still friends, actually. Um, but it was, you know, it was a burnout time. I mean, people were really, you know, um, going for it <laughs> in, in, in all, all possible ways. And do you find that that lifestyle has a shelf life? I mean, are any of the people that you know still in that world? or do people tend Yeah, to I mean, I think, it, I think at the time, you know, a lot of us younger guys in advertising, we look around and go, where do all the old people in advertising go? <laughs> <laughs> what, what happens to them? Where, where, where's this sort of like post fifty advertising graveyard? And, and I found it. It's Bath. It's called Bath. They they, they all end up in Bath. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a lot of um, sort of. Is there, are there any hangouts for the ex ad, ad world people uh, in Bath? Or is that just everywhere? I think they're, they're expensive coffee shops and restaurants and um, and and shopping places. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so if you want to sort of dip into that world, you just head to bar for a... Yeah, just head to, head to bar for the weekend. <laughs> and um, so what was it that made you, I mean, it sounds like it makes a quite extravagant lifestyle, a lot of drinking. I mean, was there a point at which you thought, this is just too much for me, I, I need to get out? Or what was it that well, 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 I think I, I was always a little bit mystified why, why I was in advertising in the first place, like a lot of people. I mean, I think it's, you know, a lot of people sort of bump into it. They, they really want to do other things that don't quite work out. And then they go, well, that looks like a bit of fun. And so I was, ne I was never really committed to it. It was never like something that I've grown up wanting to do. Um, but, it, but it was a good fun way of spending some time and earning some money when I didn't know what to do. And I think that um, there comes a point in, in, in everybody's lives when suddenly you think, actually, I want to do something that, that matters to me, that something is more aligned with my values. Um, but that kick for me didn't really happen until I had the tragedy of my brother suddenly dying, which I talk about in the Do Lecture. So I was, you know, suddenly confronted. I was creative services director of a big um, ad agency, and I got a phone call from Kuala Lumpur that my 31-year-old you know, brother had died falling from uh, uh, the building he lived in. So for me, it was tragedy that really sort of like, you know, kick-started that, that feeling of like, I, just, I can't go on doing something that I'm not really passionate about for the rest of my life, because life can be incredibly short. Mm. 
And it's amazing it's how many um, stories, both of you, which is in our events that we hear from people when it has taken that to, to make that change happen, or certainly maybe an illness, whether it's themselves or someone close to them. So well, do you think it takes that, or do you think there's anything you can do to actually... I, th I think that the, the often it does sort of take some form of tragedy, whether it's illness, relationship breaking down. Yeah, often it does. It doesn't have to. And I guess if, if, if there's one mission that I have in life, it's to sort of try to inspire people to make positive change uh, from a from, from a from a better place, you know, because I think that um, those feelings you, you get those feelings early, you just ignore them. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, if I can inspire people to sort of follow the heart a little bit earlier on in life, then um, and realize that although it, yeah, it is scary, it is a scary thing to do. Um, it, it's the best thing that you can ever do. And so, when you got this news, obviously, it must have been a you know a, a real shock for you and the family. What was that? I mean, how soon was it after that that you made this this shift, or was it just your world was rocked and, and uh, I think I think I had a sort of bit of an epiphany moment. I mean, literally, the moment I was told he died, I sort of like broke down, crying, having an emotional breakdown. But I felt like a rod of iron going up my spine, and thought I can do this. You know, I can actually one handle you know sorting out his body and, and, and the funeral, but also um, you know I felt that I had the power to, uh, to transform and change my life. I felt that instantly. He was like, I can do what I want to do. The, the, the tricky part was the fact that I hadn't got a clue what I wanted to do. Mm. <laughs> so, so you know, it was one thing sort of realizing I wanted to follow my heart. Uh, uh, the, the problem then was one, finding out which of those noises going on in my head was my heart, or which of those feelings was my heart and which wasn't. And, and what to do, because I think I've been an alcoholic, so I've actually been sober now for about 21 years, but I was a, an alcoholic. So if you're a big drinker, um, you bury your sort of hobbies and, uh, and passions and things that you want to do under, under that sort of haze. So I really didn't know what I wanted to do, but I, but I knew that I didn't want to work in advertising anymore. I, I, I did know that I wanted to follow something that meant something to me. Mm. And did you, well, did you realise you had a drink problem until that point, or was it just something? Um, actually, uh, I'd stopped drinking uh, before I heard about my brother dying. So I, I, I actually stopped drinking when, when another, so it wasn't a tragedy, but it was a major life moment. Um, uh, my girlfriend was pregnant, and she gave me just a, you know, it was a crossroads moment. It was like either you stay with me and, 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 you, and you cut, cut out or cut down the drink and we have a child together, or you carry on. And so it was a simple choice for me. I didn't, I didn't want to be a drunk dad. Mm. I didn't want to be a drunk dad. Um, so I'd made that change already. But again, it was like, you know, birth of my son that made me change. It wasn't a sort of, you know, sudden sort of realisation that I had a problem and I needed to do something. Um, so that, that definitely helped me in a way um, because I was, uh, had more energy. I had more focus in, uh, to, to make a change. But, but I did go into a period, I'd say, a good two or three years of genuinely not knowing what I wanted to do. And I think most of us, when we enter into that uh, place of not knowing, it's so uncomfortable that we want to grasp uh, anything to take that pain away. So we will construct ideas of what we want to do that sort of loosely answer it and make us feel that we've got an answer, but aren't really what we want to do. Um, and I was lucky that I didn't do that. I, I'd started practicing yoga and meditation and I stayed with the discomfort long enough um, that uh, some of the things that really mattered to me sort of like uh, arose from that discomfort. And did you have any sort of strategies or um, people to rely on at that time to get you through it or ways to cope? Um, no, when it says strategy, a strategy would be too, too strong a, a term. I didn't, I didn't have a definitive strategy, but definitely things that I did, I talked to a lot of people. I talked to a lot of people about my discomfort and the fact that I didn't know. And again, that, that was a new thing for me to do, because I think most of us, when we don't know something, we tend to keep quiet about it. So I did openly share the fact that I didn't know. Um, I, I did read a lot. Um, I went to lots of different workshops. I went out of my comfort zone. I tried new things. Um, I became open, I guess. I became open to the possibility that I might find that thing, even though I didn't know what that thing was.
And so, um, I mean, what was the reaction to your old sort of colleagues? I mean, was it, I can imagine it's quite a macho world with the ad world. And yeah, well, I mean, weirdly what happened to me was um, I, I was involved in a big digital media startup called Talkcast uh, in 99, 2000, which was people from Sega, News International, Virgin, you know, trying to build a Yahoo type of thing from the bottom up. And then in the, in the dot-com crash, that sort of fizzled out. That was my major client at an ad agency. And I actually went to then work with them on what was called mobile data services. So everybody at the time knew that mobile data was going to be huge, but there, there wasn't such a thing as mobile marketing. People didn't have smartphones. They didn't really know how it was going to pan out. So I went to work for a mobile marketing technology company um, before mobile marketing actually existed. Um, and went to like world, the World Mobile World Congress in Cannes and was dem demoing sort of interactive text messaging applications and stuff like that. So I was involved in a tech company, but what, what, what they didn't realize was that, that I was also training to be a yoga teacher at the same time. So in 2002, I had this sort of weird thing where I was involved in a management buyout of this mobile marketing tech business, and I was training to be a yoga teacher at the same time. Mm -hmm. And the, MBO, uh, and the MBO failed. If the MBO hadn't failed, who knows what I would have been doing. Um, uh, but, but it did fail, and so I just started teaching yoga. So luckily I didn't have to give up a, 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 a job. The job gave me up. Right. And um, so it sounds like you've, you've uh, learned a lot over these years, and you've obviously got interested in, in mindfulness through yoga, I guess. And this is legit. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think the, the, thing, the thing with mindfulness was that, I guess, um, after teaching, I taught yoga for about five years and nothing but yoga. And, and it's hard, hard making a living as a yoga teacher. And so I thought, I need to do something that I can charge a bit more money for in, in corporates. And someone said, yeah, why don't you do this mindfulness stuff? And it's probably about six years ago. And I go, yeah, I better get trained by someone in, in mindfulness then. So I sort of looked into John Kabat-Zinn, and you know, he was the sort of father of modern-day mindfulness in the States. And uh, I read all his books, and I thought, this is yoga. <laughs> this is repackaged yoga. Um, and they would admit, he would admit to that. So, so I realized, actually, the mindfulness movement was really a repackaging for me of yoga. Um, and so um, I started doing a similar thing. Um, uh, with my own uh, mindfulness course, which I started about six years ago, which is a sort of a, a, a six-week course, which is a little bit more um, accessible, hopefully, and I do that you know, uh, in companies and, and, and to the public. Um, but, but mindfulness is, is, is one of those things, like, say, th even, say, two or three years ago, I'd ask a group in a room, who's heard of mindfulness? And maybe one or two people put their hands up. Um, you, you now ask that question, and no one, everybody knows, yeah? Well, everybody thinks they know. Yeah, yeah exactly. And um, so how did the book come about? This book, Do Breathe, uh, part of the Do Books um, or Do Lectures book series, um, was that after your talk? That these yeah, the, the, the book came after the talk. So, so uh, I guess what happened was um, two things coincided. What, one, um, I created this sort of uh, coaching framework that I call Well Doing. So Well Doing was, uh, I really got into the work of David Allen um, and his stress-free productivity system, GTD. And I'd realized that um, when you bring together a really good productivity system with mindfulness, the two things really feed off each other. And actually, a lot of the sort of like low-level noise in my head wasn't because of my inability to be mindful. It's because I wasn't handling my, my stuff very well. Um, so I created this sort of well-doing approach of sort of really bringing together what I call well-being and well-doing. Uh, I think a lot of people think of them as being uh, antagonistic, um, but actually they can, they can be integrated. Um, and so I was pitching a book called Well-Doing, and David had asked me to do a talk about my journey from uh, being a drunk ad man, or from being off my head um, as an ad man to being on my head as a yoga teacher, um, and, uh, and an app uh, called Breathing that we'll talk about later. And after doing the talk, you know, the publisher of the do, do, do book company, Miranda West, just came up and said, you know, would you be interested in, in turning this into, into a book in the series? So the book Do Breathe, Calm Your Mind, Find Focus, Get Stuff Done is really a mashup for me of the worlds of mindfulness, well-being and yoga and productivity hacks. Um, because for me, they, they, they do work together. That's now become a very popular thing I'd say I mean like people you know that there have been happiness hacks and and that whole idea that you can actually look after your health and well-being and that can improve your productivity is a zeitgeist thing I mean you know again three or four years ago you could go into a company and talk about those things and um, <coughs> really wouldn't be interested now uh, everybody wants to get more of that sure 
And in terms of the, just curious to know about the, the book writing process from your perspective, uh, it's something on our radar, so I'm always interested to hear from a, an author. And Yeah, it's an interesting one. It's an interesting journey. I mean, I think that um, I was lucky that I had a writing coach, so a guy called Ian Sanders um, was a writing coach and helped me at the early stages of, uh, of creating the structure. I sort of foolishly believed that I was going to find my my process and then I was going to be writing blogs about this process that I found that really worked. And in fact, the first chapter sort of worked like that. So I would get up really early, I'd do my meditation, my yoga, um, I'd put my headphones on, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd boot up ByWord, which is like a distraction-free writing uh, uh, zone, and I'd get in my zone and I would just write for an hour in a state of flow, it would all come out. Mm -hmm. For three mornings, it, that worked like that. And I thought, I'm going to do that. Three of these inflow mornings of, of getting stuff out, and then I'm going to do a fourth day where I do the edit, and then I'm going to send it off to the publisher, and then I'm going to start working on chapter number two. Chapter one went like that, and that was the only chapter that went like that. <laughs> it was the only chapter that worked out like that. Everything else was really hard work, actually. And do you think that's because, um, sorry. Do you think that's because life got in the way or just... Um, it just... It's, it, it's partly, I can understand why writers and people go away and they find somewhere because, yeah, interruptions, the, the, the most difficult thing, I think, are, are emotional interruptions. So for me, if I was up early and I could control my environment completely and I'd slept well and I'd done my yoga and my meditation, um, I could get into the zone. But if I had you know, um, my, my daughter or my wife, if they if created some form of emotional discomfort and, and I lost the moment, then, then I'd have to go for a walk. Right. <laughs> um, and, and, what, and what I found was, you know, there were other mornings like that. It wasn't only, only at the beginning of the, of the book, but definitely what I got good at, uh, and, and I recommend, is I got good at, at working. I mean, I think it's, I don't know who did the quote, was uh, when you can't create work. Yeah. Um, and I think that what I got good at was that on a day when I really didn't feel like I was in flow, um, my creative muse wasn't with me, I would still get Evernote out, I'd go through my references, I would highlight stuff, I would, uh, you know, I, I would do some work that was moving the project forwards, even on the bad days. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's a struggle because you, you, hit, you hit a lot of emotional things, you know, a lot of walls of like, who do you think you are to write a book? Why, what are you going to do that no one else has done before? And then you pick up some reference book you know, by, written by some great guy that you respect. And I'm never going to be able to like this. And what am I doing? Um, and it was emotionally really tough. And I, and, I, and I knew that it was tough when I'd be getting in the bath for the second time that day. That was the <laughs> sign that, that it wasn't going to be a good writing day. But I got better at working, working on those on those on those tough days and keeping up momentum, and had a great publisher. I mean, you got to, you need you need a publisher. And luckily, with the Do Book Company, they do. They have a structural editor, they have a copy editor, they have someone doing the front cover, someone doing the design, photographer. They have a really full team of craftspeople supporting you. And I think uh, because it's so easy to, to self-publish nowadays, people uh, I think underestimate the importance of having um, other critical eyes um, on on the work that you're doing. Mm. So it's the uh, imposter syndrome in full swing, then, by the time. Yeah, full imposter syndrome, and uh, as you know, I mean, I think uh, everyone that's done anything feels that. It's it's a very very common feeling, imposter sy syndrome. Yeah, um, and. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's so bad that you really just want to curl up and not do the thing, you know. Um, and so finding the strength to, 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 to do something on those bad days, um, I think, is, is critical. And I suppose coming on the other side of it, it must be quite nice to have a thing, a product that you've created. It's great to have a thing. Yeah, yeah. It's, great. It's, it's, it's great to have a thing. And it's also, um, I do coaching work with clients. And, um, you know, I can now say, you know, before we start coaching, have a read of this book. It's very easy to, 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 to take in. And that gives you an overview of the sort of stuff that I think we should work on rather than giving them five or six fat books uh, of theory um, that would be daunting. So it's a very useful book. I think, yeah, I mean, for my, I've, I've got a 20-year-old uh, 20 son and a 16-year-old daughter, and uh, if, they, if they could take on board at least some of the stuff in there, I think it's, it's, it's a, everyone would love to leave a book for their children to live life a little bit better. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm really pleased that I've done it. Yeah, I'm really pleased that I've done it. And um, 
uh, but you know, life goes on. You know, it's like that, that. You know, you don't create something and you can't just kick back and go that's it. Although I guess there are people that are still you know, flying around the world doing talks on the one book that they wrote, and there's still bands touring playing the one hit that they have you know, 20 years ago. So maybe life will turn out like that. But I, but I hope that, that I create some other things of of value too. Yeah, I mean, there's something for me appealing coming from the digital world too, where. Uh, um, you're never done, you know, if you're building a website, an app, a campaign, sometimes you never get that feeling of accomplishment of launching fully because it's always yes. something. So, yeah, I like the idea of a physical product that's, that's done, even if you, it's not the only thing you might do. Yeah, I think that's going to be an interesting development. There's a guy called Jean-Franco Chico who runs Social Media Week London, and he has a, a, a group called uh, 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 Diffie. And Diffy is like you know, digital physical. It's people who operate with mashing up digital and physical worlds. And I think that's definitely going to be something that we're going to see a lot more of um, with the Internet of Things and you know stuff. Um, and also, we you know like you know, in music, everyone likes vinyl now. We we like physicality. You know, um, I, I I can never get into Kindle. You know, I can't get into eBooks. You know, I really do like you know the, the smell. Um, I was about to say the taste, but that would be a bit weird. <laughs> but, but the smell of books. Yeah. <laughs> it depends on if it's a scratch and sniff or something. Scratch and sniff book, yeah. Scratch yeah. and sniff websites, one day. Yeah, it's the future. Um, but yeah, no, that interests us, I think, because you know, we're trying to build this community that's trying to get that balance of you know, online interaction, you know, um, interact from anywhere, but also that physical presence at an event or an experience you might be part of, because it's hard to replicate that or impossible to replicate that, I think, um, yeah. through, through digital. Yeah, um, it's the same thing with notes, isn't it? I mean, I, I do a lot of notes um, digitally, but, you know, you get paper and pen out and something happens like with paper and pen that, that, that doesn't happen when you're tapping into your phone or your, or, or your laptop. Yeah. Which leads us on a bit to this um, app that you've developed. So it's called BreatheSync, right? Just tell us a little bit about this, and it sounds like it's almost an evolution from the work you've done. Yeah, so, so I think BreatheSync, it, it's quite a nice little story, really, because it shows how creation of, of interesting things doesn't always come through some strategic approach. I mean, there's people who write about a concept called emergence, how things emerge. And actually, BreatheSync emerged from me meeting up with an old school friend, um, uh, Simon Wegger, who I hadn't seen for 20 years. And he really worked in people like places like BBC, Philips, um, in electrical engineering. And I'd gone the way of like you know, advertising the sort of creative route. Um, but where we came together was he, had, he has a company called iFleet that do uh, monitoring of, of heart data for athletes so that they know when they should be training hard and when they should be having rest days. And uh, uh, HRV, heart rate variability, is a really good measure of, of, an, uh, of a, an athlete's readiness to perform. And what he noticed when he added uh, a three-minute breathing technique called coherent breathing, when you breathe in rhythm with your heart, suddenly all these numbers lifted up. And he couldn't understand how a three-minute breathing technique could have the same impact on his physiology that hours of running and cycling and all this training that he was doing. I sort of already knew about the power of breathing from my yoga work. I mean, what a lot of people don't realize about yoga is that they think of yoga as being this sort of physical practice of people in lycra um, uh, doing crazy things with their body. But in fact, the most advanced yoga practices are breathing practices. And the reason for that is uh, breathing is a great way to control your physiology, control your mental state, and enable you to, to, to reach your potential um, moment by moment and, to, and to, live, to, to live and perform better. So we, should, we had this sort of meeting of minds about, about breathing, and we thought rather than meeting up once a month for coffee, let's, let's build something for fun. And we built BreatheSync for fun. And because it was for fun, I, you know, we did like hundreds of designs that, you know, that we wouldn't have been able to afford if we were paying someone. We, we messed around for a good year and a half. Um, for fun, trying to get something that we were, we were really happy with. We weren't really thinking about other people. It was something that we wanted to use every day. Um, and, and when we launched it, we launched it really as a sort of side project. It was a side project that um, it gave us a good reason to meet up, and it was fun. And when I did the talk at the Do Lectures in 2014, I did a sort of live demo of this sort of just out of beta app, which is a sort of high stress moment. I was about to say, that's, that's quite a brave thing it's to do. Thing. And actually, if you look at, if you look at the, the video, I mean, there was a couple of moments where it's not quite as it should be. 
but, uh, but but I did do that and 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 when that talk went live in September 2014 the, the app at the time we were selling for like ten dollars or seven pounds it was, it was just a lot of time had gone into to, to making it and we thought we'd make it free for a day and, and to the do lectures community and maybe a couple of hundred people can, can have it for free and, and tell us what they think of it um, and I went to check my iTunes connect the, the, the morning after and we had fourteen and a half thousand downloads wow. And so that was like, I was used to looking at one or two or something, and suddenly we had this big spike. Um, and that made us realize that there was, there was something in this and there was a, there was a mass market application. Um, so from then, you know, I've been really sort of you know, building the business plans, building the team, raise, raising money to turn it into a, a proper business. And, and that's going on at the moment. It's an iPhone app, yeah, so you can download it um, it's from iPhone. It's now £3.99 or $4.99. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a very simple um, uh, app. You put your finger over the camera, it picks up your heart rate, analyzes your heart rate, and then creates a personalized breathing rhythm. So, so it's like a biohack, hacks into your heart data to create the optimal way for you to breathe, to get into a state of flow if you want to go and do something, or get you into a deep relaxing state, uh, relaxation state if you if, if you're tired out after a busy day. Um, people use it to help them sleep. People help uh, uh, use it before they're going to create something or do talks. Um, I, I used it before chatting to you this morning. Um, and yeah, I love 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 people in your community to try it out and tell me what they think about it. Um, and uh, help help us build an even better version that we'll, we'll be launching later on this year. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I think it's something that particularly with a just starting out a new venture or even on that road already as an entrepreneur you need that time out to just take stock sometimes and and not just get on the to-do list every minute yeah yeah i mean i think that, that, that there is uh with technology uh, particularly uh timing is everything i mean i remember you know working on mobile marketing ideas that were just too early and so I was going around, you know, big clients, everybody loved what we're doing, everybody you know, thought it was great, but no one bought it. <laughs> um, it was too early. Um, so timing is really critical. So sometimes you, you need to know when things have slowed down for a good reason and when they've slowed down for a bad reason. Yeah. And, and, and you know, um, success isn't always about um, getting a lot done in a short space of time. Yeah, I think it's about done. timing, and, and 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 that's a really really tricky thing. No one really knows the answer, um, but but I guess you know sometimes we can feel that you know success is all always about moving fast, but actually sometimes it can be about moving slowly too. Yeah, we had a bit of a work experiment a few months back when we went to the, the French Alps, and we um, yeah we found that um, when we were left to our own devices, there was moments of acceleration. So there was a bunch of startup teams together. We were one of them, five teams. Okay. And actually we found there was moments of acceleration where we'd all just get our heads down, you know, get work done, maybe for a couple of hours and then head off into the, the mountains for a hike uh, and just yeah. you know, just decelerate for a couple of hours. And then when you come back to the work, you're just a lot more clear about what you're doing. And, and not. Yeah. I think there's a great line, which is when I'm busy, I'm stupid. And I, I definitely feel that sometimes. Yeah. And then another one is, you know, if, if you're too busy to meditate for five minutes a day, you meditate for half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and I think that, that that whole thing of you know we call we call that ultradian rhythms of like you know these rhythms through the day about normally about an hour and a half of activity you need to have twenty minutes of like rest um, and that's how you maximise performance. But uh, there was a running coach I spoke to and he talked about working with um, long distance runners in Africa and they would do a run in the morning and he'd say go and rest now and we'll do a second run in the evening and these guys would just lie down and rest all day and do nothing. And they'd do a great run again then in the evening. When he came to work in Europe and he told European runners to rest, and um, what did they do? They went to the cinema, they played PlayStation, they went shopping, you know, they, they didn't rest. What they called rest was still stimulating activity. Right. And, and, and I think that we do, we underestimate the importance of rest and recovery, slowing right down, taking time out. Um, uh, and if you're stressed and you're anxious about something, it's really, really hard to think that the solution to having too much on your to-do list is to do nothing. Yeah, exactly. But it's often true. <clears throat> 
So um, finally, I'm conscious of time, um, Michael. This Friday, I believe you're in London um, Do your workshop, is that right? Yes, yeah, so I'm doing my first uh, workshop this Friday for the Do Lectures called Do Breathe. It's at Ubrew um, in SE24. It's a one-day workshop. Um, and we'll be you know, looking at these things. We're looking at mindfulness, productivity, how you can integrate these things into your life so that you, that you, that you breathe well, you, you are well, and, and you can also do well too. Awesome. And, uh, and we've talked about getting you along to one of our events. I think India next month didn't quite happen this time around. But, um, no, but, but, but I would love to, Lawrence. I'd love to. Yeah, so, um, you know, summer camp this year might be on the, on the calendar. So we'll Sounds great. Out. <laughs> cool. Okay, well, thanks again for talking to me. And, um, yeah, if you want to follow up Michael on Twitter, what's your... Twitter your... is mtownsendw. So it's M-T-O-W-N-S-E-N-D-W. That's at mtownsendw. Website is stillworks dot org s t i w l w o r k s dot org and breathe sync that's breathe with an e sync a second word get that on uh, the app store you can find links also on my website to the book do breathe calm your mind find focus get stuff done which you can get from the do book company the do book dot co yeah and actually and Miranda sent us a discount code so if enters the code happy they'll get a discount Check so the code happy at the dobook.co and and get the book with some money off um but yeah any, any feedback on the app the work that i do appreciated and i'd love to see you at the summer camp lawrence <laughs> brilliant yeah, festival yes exactly after wilderness last year yeah okay. all right thanks again michael have a great day take care cheers bye bye, -bye.